fire on their heads. I've got some tongues of fire on my stole today. Um, but what we read said that the tongues as of fire simply came to rest on them. Last month, I was, uh, Peter and I actually were at a church workers conference, pastors conference, and the presenters posed a hypothetical question. Your house is on fire, what do you take out? So I want to ask you, I want some answers today. What would you take out if your house was on fire? Yourself. Good answer. Your family. Computer. Yeah, computer. Pictures, photos, right? Maybe a photo album, if you still have them. <laughs> Your pet. Yeah, that's a good answer. Cell phone. Yeah, because cell phone's got all that stuff on. Maybe, maybe some financial documents. Insurance policies, yeah. Um, maybe some family heirlooms, some jewelry or something like that. So, yeah, those are all good answers. I remember hearing this question posed when I was in youth group as a teenager, and I think the answer that they were expecting us to give was, you take out your Bible. And I think, well, nowadays that's not so important because you can have your Bible on your phone. You can go to chapters and get a new Bible tomorrow. Uh, maybe the only reason why you take your Bible is if you had copious notes in there about things that you'd learned as you studied the Bible. But I think the best answer is the first one that we got. You'd take yourself out of your house if it was on fire. You'd save yourself, your family members. That's why my wife and I, we have one of those roll-up emergency ladders under our bed because we're on the second floor. So if the rest of our house was on fire, we could put it out the window and crawl down to safety. Saving ourselves is most important. Well, at our church workers conference, the conversation moved into the institutional church is on fire. The institutional church is on fire. I like to say the church is leaking. You know, there are people trickling out of the church. They're losing their faith. In a book simply entitled Unchristian, the authors did a study of young adults in America, and they discovered that those young adults have the feeling that Christians, the church, but Christians are irrelevant, boring, judgmental, hypocritical, bigoted, and a few other choice words. That's their impression of the church, of Christian people these days. It's like science and evolution is rising up in our society and the church is leaking or it's on fire. I mean, you could look around us today, right? There are books that have been written about this topic, articles that have been written. It was the topic of our conference last month. The discussion was, the church is on fire, what do we save? Could we be the church without a budget? Could we be the church without the church council, the leaders? Could we be the church without a piano, without the liturgy and the hymns? Could we be the church without a pastor? Could we be the church without a building? And then I think the real question is, could we be the church without potlucks? Probably not. At that point at the conference, my memory was inspired to go back to my high school English class. And I had to look up in my, my yearbook to see if I could remember which teacher it was. I don't even remember which grade it was. That's how little I enjoyed high school English. Um, but I remember studying the book Fahrenheit 451. How many of you have read that book? One, two, three, four, five maybe. Um, Fahrenheit 451, it was a 1953 novel written by Ray Bradbury. 
And Fahrenheit 451 is the auto-ignition temperature at which books burn. Let me tell you the story. It's going to take a few moments. Let me tell you the story because the end of the story really fits in with what I want to say today. So in this novel, Guy Montag is a fireman who burns books in a futuristic American city. In Montag's world, firemen start fires rather than putting them out. They burn down houses where books are found. You see, the people in that society no longer read books. They don't enjoy nature. They spend time by themselves. They don't think independently. They don't have meaningful conversations. Instead, they drive very fast. They watch excessive amounts of television on parlor wall-sized sets, and they listen to the radio on seashell radio sets attached to their ears. I think Ray Bradbury understood what the future was going to be, because that's what we have. We have parlor wall-sized television sets. Well, one day, Montag encounters a gentle 17-year-old neighbor named Clarice, who opens his eyes to the emptiness of his life with her innocently penetrating questions and her unusual love of people and of nature. So over the next few days, Montag experiences a series of disturbing events. First, his wife Mildred attempts suicide by swallowing a bottle of sleeping pills. Then when he responds to a fire alarm that an old, that an old woman, woman had a stash of hidden literature in her home, the woman shocks him by choosing to be burned alive along with her books. He managed to actually steal a rare copy of the Bible from her home before any of his co-workers noticed. A few days later, he heard that Clarice was killed by a speeding car. So Montag's dissatisfaction with life increases, and he begins to search for a solution in a stash of books that he himself has stolen from some of the fires he attended and that he had hidden in an air conditioning vent in his home. One day, Montag is sick, and his fire chief, Beatty, pays a visit to his house. Beatty explains to him that it's quite natural for a fireman to go through that phase of wondering what books have to offer, and he explains how books came to be banned in the first place. According to Beatty, special interest groups and other minorities objected to books that offended them, and soon society as a whole decided to simply burn books rather than permit these conflicting opinions. Beatty tells Montag to take 24 hours or so to see if his stolen books contain anything worthwhile, and then he should turn them in so that they can be incinerated. Montag begins a long night of reading. Now Montag's wife, she prefers television to her husband's company, and he can't understand, or she can't understand why he would take that terrible risk of reading books. He remembers that he once met a retired English professor named Faber sitting in a park. And he decides that Faber might be able to help him understand some of the things that he's reading. So he visits him, and Faber tells him that the value of books lies in the detailed awareness of life that they contain. Faber agrees to help Montag with his reading, and they concoct a risky scheme to actually overthrow the status quo. Faber will contact a printer and begin reproducing books, and Montag is going to place them in the homes of firemen to discredit the profession and to destroy the machinery of censorship. Faber gives him that two-way radio earpiece so that he can hear what Montag hears and he can talk to him secretly. So Montag goes home. He finds that two of his wife's friends are there watching television. Their conversation is so superficial that he takes out a book of poetry and he begins to read to them. He reads Dover Beach. His wife tries to explain to her friends that reading poetry is a standard way for firemen to demonstrate the uselessness of literature. But the women are extremely disturbed 
by this poem, and they leave to file a complaint against Montag. Montag goes to the fire station. He hands over that one of his books to Beatty. And during their conversation, an alarm sounds, and they rush off in their fire engines to answer the alarm, only to find out that the alarm is at Montag's own house. He sees Mildred, his wife, get into a cab with a suitcase, and he realizes that his own wife had betrayed him. Beatty forces Montag to burn down his own house. And when he's done, Beatty places him under arrest. But Beatty continues to berate Montag so much so that Montag turns the flamethrower on his superior, burns him to ashes. Montag knocks the other firemen unconscious and he runs. But there's this mechanical hound, a monstrous machine that Beatty has set to attack Montag. It pounces on him. He manages to also destroy it with his flamethrower. Then he escapes with some other books that he had buried in his backyard. He hides these in another fireman's house, and he calls in an alarm to that man's home. And then he goes off to Faber's house, where he learns that another mechanical hound had been put on his trail, along with helicopters and a, and the TV crew. Montag takes some of Faber's clothing, and he runs off toward the river. The whole city watches this chase, and finally they see that... Uh, the helicopters and the television crew see someone get caught and the hound kills actually an innocent man, not Montag. And that satisfied the viewers that justice had been done. Montag goes downriver and he founds a welcoming group of people called the Book People, led by a man named Granger. And they're part of a nationwide network of intellectuals and book lovers who have memorized entire books, many great works of literature and philosophy. They hope that these books may be of help to mankind in the aftermath of a war that has just been declared. Montag's assignment is to read and to memorize the book of Ecclesiastes from the Bible. Enemy jets appear in the sky and completely obliterate the city with bombs, and Montag and his new friends move on to search for survivors in the city and to rebuild civilization. That's the end of the story. And at the end of the book, it's interesting that people actually become books. That's how the books survived. That's how civilization would survive, by still treasuring those books of philosophy and, and literature. Somehow I think that's how the church will survive too. It's not that we will become Bible books. It's not that we will memorize them, that Joe will become Ephesians, and Tessa will become the Gospel of Luke, and Dennis will become the book of Exodus. That will be important going forward, that we know the Bible, that we know if you've got a red-letter version of the Bible, that we know those words of Jesus from the Gospels. But even more important, it will be important that we live out those red letters of Jesus in the Gospels. That we become little Christs. That's a phrase that Martin Luther used. That we be little Christs in our world. It's interesting that the word disciple is used in the Gospels. It's used in the book of Acts. That word is not even once used in the epistles, in Paul's letters, or letter of James, or Peter. The concept of disciple is used in those books, but it's always worded a little bit differently. It's used, it uses terms like a believer, or maybe a brother or sister, a follower of Christ, a Christian a couple of times, or a learner about Christ. But it doesn't use the word disciple. It uses some picture images sometimes. In Galatians 4, it talks about Christ being formed in us. In Ephesians 4, it talks about attaining the whole measure of the, stat, or of the fullness of Christ. In Philippians 2, Paul talks about the mind or the attitude 
of Christ. In Colossians 1, he talks about Christ in us, the hope of glory. And I remember that one especially because I attended my first church convention as a pastor in Estevan, Saskatchewan in 1985. And uh, Dr. Oswald Hoffman, who was the speaker on the Lutheran Hour for many years, he was our guest essayist at the convention. I remember him standing in front of all the delegates with just his Greek Bible. He was explaining that passage from Colossians 1. Christ in you, the hope of glory, and then the theme of the convention, him we proclaim. Paul, in Philippians 4, talked about being or living out what is true, whatever is right and noble and pure, anything that's admirable or excellent or praiseworthy. He said, what you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, do. He was, that was Paul talking, but Christ was living in him and through him, so really that was the attitudes of Christ as well. In all of those things, in all those pictures of discipleship, we see what actually was taking place in Acts chapter 2 on Pentecost Day. There it said that the disciples were declaring the wonders of God in languages that people understood. We heard those 15 different nations that were represented there in Jerusalem on Pentecost Day. And they each heard the message in their own language. What are the wonders of God? Well, it's about Jesus. It's about his healings, his teachings, his miracles. It's about the fact that you and I are adopted into God's family in holy baptism. It's about God's grace and salvation. The wonders of God are that Jesus died for us and rose for us so that we might be his for all eternity. The wonders of God are our forgiveness. The Holy Spirit, which was promised at the end of Peter's message. And the fact that Jesus is Lord in Christ. Ultimately, at the end of the passage we read today, we see that the pouring out of the Holy Spirit was the fulfillment of God's promise made through the prophet Joel in the Old Testament. God would pour out his Spirit on old men and young men, on old women and young women. That happened on that Pentecost day after Jesus ascended into heaven. And Peter's inspired message took place there. And the result was that people accepted his message and believed his message. And 3,000 people were baptized. God still pours out his Holy Spirit on us today. Still on us today. The church today does need to be on fire. But not the building. The people. The people of God need to be on fire, not to evacuate the building, not to evacuate the church, but for the intended result that Jesus spoke, both maybe on the day of his ascension, where he said, you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. That's the reason that the church needs to be on fire, to be witnesses, and for the result or the purpose that that passage from Joel ended with. So that everyone who calls on the name of the Lord would be saved. Yeah, the church is on fire. People have left. The church is leaking. But everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will still be saved. May God grant us his grace to be disciples of Jesus on fire. May we declare the wonders of God to others in language that they can understand. Not lofty language, not necessarily using Bible words, but simple language that will reach their hearts. And may we be little Christs, people of the book, people of the Bible, to our world, so that people may read us, may, that they will read our words our deeds and our lives, and may they see Jesus and call on him to be saved.
Please join me as we pray. Holy Spirit, we pray that you would set us on fire today. Help us to be little Christ in our world, in our families, in our neighborhoods, at our places of work, to all that we meet, so that they would see Jesus in us. Help us to speak your words, to know them deeply in our hearts. Holy Spirit, fill us and mold us and shape us so that we might be witnesses of Jesus where we live in our daily lives. In the name of Jesus, our Savior, we pray. Amen.